Karajan. Um, so Kanaka did his uh, PhD uh, with uh, Larry Abbott at uh, Brandeis University in Columbia, right? I, I remember if I remember correctly when he transitioned from uh, Brandeis to Columbia. And then he did, uh, she did the postdoc with um, uh, William Bialak uh, at Princeton University. So uh, some very interesting work and, uh, and, and I really like it. Um, and uh, today we are very happy to have Kanaka here to tell us uh, some his new work or recent work on the recurrent neural network. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. This is my second time doing this today. So, um, so if my voice falters in the middle, then it, it, this is not personal, it's not on you. It's that you have a very exhausted lecturer. Um, thank you so much uh, to you all for making it. And some of you, I know that it's super, super early in the morning. I don't think I have ever made it to an 8 a.m. lecture um, in, in, in any type of recent memory. So I really appreciate you all coming out today. Um, and so let me share my screen real quick, and then I'll give you a little bit of an introduction about what um, today's subject is. Okay, so when, you know, Rava approached me to do the summer school, um, what he had wanted everyone to be able to do is for all the lecturers to collectively with their basic lecture and advanced lecture, uh, take you through a little bit of a mini course. Right, what he what is designed here is essentially like an entire field of study. Right, it's my research, and a lot of foundational elements that go into this lecture. And so there's the basic lecture, and then there's the advanced lecture. And I this is why I had to kind of title it um, uh, title it What can we learn about the brain from recurrent neural network models? So you know, in the basic portion and the advanced lecture, I've divided up the subject matter into um, into a foundational elements section, which is what I'm going to teach you about today. Um, I've titled it Method and Logic in Recurrent Neural Network Models. You will hear me referring to them as RNNs um, throughout this lecture. What we'll be doing in this lecture is visiting some of the building blocks that make up neural network models, specifically recurrent neural network models, why we do emphasize the recurrent part of recurrent neural network models, um, what happens in a linear network, what happens when you put in nonlinearities into these networks, and really why do we bother, right? Like why bother with recurrence in neural network models? So at the end of this, what I would like you to take away from this lecture today is the mathematical tractability of recurrent neural network models, along with the fact that they provide a rich substrate on which to understand brain function, specifically functions that unfold over time or dynamics. Then in the advanced lecture, which is you know, Friday or Saturday morning, depending on, on, on which straw you picked, we'll talk about some applications of RNNs in the field of neuroscience, specifically how they've been used for mechanism discovery. So what does it mean when you train a recurrent neural network model to do something? What does training entail? What happens once you train networks to match something? What do you do when you analyze networks like this? What is reverse engineering them? And what about this reverse engineering process of networks trained to match data is useful to us as neuroscientists. And I'll leave you with a few future outcomes, maybe a few project ideas that you might wanna take back to your own labs or wanna work on. So today we wanna visit the foundational elements, some of the mathematics underlying recurrent neural network models. And I want you to take away from them the mathematical tractability um, of these type of network models. So why recurrent neural network models, right? So what we wanna do at the end of this mini course or the end of these two lectures is to leave with the intuition that cognition is fundamentally dynamic. So when we're looking at any type of brain function, for example, learning, remembering, deciding, even in this little video that you see of Heidi the octopus having a dream, all of that unfolds over time. So in the absence of time varying function, the word cognition does not make any sense. So uh, the understanding of fundamentally any type of cognitive or behavioral action relies on our understanding of dynamics. And dynamics in neural network models can only come from recurrence. And this is why recurrent neural network models have become such a cornerstone. 
So here's a little aside though, right? There are network models that people have built, such as those using feed forward interactions in the brain, and those have been used quite profitably. So let's say Heidi the octopus is looking at a crab, right? For an object recognition kind of task, a feed forward network is perfectly valid. And in fact, many different labs and some of these references that I've put down here, and I'll provide the slides to you at the end, will be useful further reading for you all. Or if recurrent, or if recurrent neural networks are not your jam and this type of layered architecture is more your um, taste and problems, then you can look at those types of papers. There are biological correlates of this type of feed forward interaction in the brain. So essentially when I say feed forward, it basically means a bucket brigade, right? Excitation passes from unidirectionally from one active layer or brain region to another active layer or brain region. This, however, is valid if Heidi the octopus is looking at a crab and has to make an object recognition kind of task very quickly. On the other hand, if Heidi the octopus has to think about the crab when there is no crab in front of it, when she has to think about what happens, uh, you know, if, if it's a partly occluded crab, is it still a crab? What happens if it's a moving crab? Is it still a crab? Tasks of that nature, or in fact, even when Heidi the octopus is having herself a dream, about crabs, then what you need are internally generated dynamics, which can come from feed forward and feedback interactions. So on the left of the slide, what you see is a simplified version of, of the, of the um, Feldman Van Essen famous diagram that you must have seen in textbooks. So what this indicates is this is actually the simplified version of the richness that is present in the mammalian brain. And you see that there's a lot of interactions that go both feed forward and feedback. Feedback interactions result in dynamics, which I've already told you is my belief that is a fundamental property of cognitive action in the brain. So RNNs, recurrent neural network models, are convenience because they innately contain feed forward and feedback interactions, which is what recurrent interactions actually mean. So there's people that are coming um, into, the, into, the, into the waiting room I don't know if so they we were take care of this. So, so okay, they... got it. Understood. So RNNs capture both uh, feed forward and feedback interactions. And so what we want to understand are the mathematical foundations of these types of networks. So I'm going to take everything that you see on the left, right, this extreme complexity that's present in biology, on which it's not just me, but many, many other labs also work on, uh, work on the subject. And I'm going to abstract it away to a very simple neural network model, like this ball and stick kind of diagram that you see here on the right. And that's the kind of framework that we're gonna be working with today. And we'll try to understand these fundamental building blocks. And then in the applied version of the lecture, we we'll wanna see um, what happens with these networks. Now, remember the roadmap to where we're going actually results in training a network model that looks like this into the full complexity of Heidi the octopus having a dream with you know, multi-area interactions, with, um, with you know, actually training them to have some kind of structure. But on the way to getting there, we have to understand some of the foundational elements. So what are the foundational elements or the Lego building blocks of recurrent neural network models? There's basically two, which again points to the extreme tractability of this model system. So one of them is model neuron-like units. Keep in mind, this is an abstraction, right? Real biological neurons have a lot of structure, which you simplified into this, let's imagine that life is an ideal sphere kind of physicist bias. So the abstraction here says there's model neuron-like units, um, and, and these neuron-like units take in some function of their external input or some kind of current from somewhere and produce some kind of output. And this transformation between inputs and outputs for each of these model neuron-like units goes through what I have written down here as activation function. Now, if you're trained as an engineer or a physicist, you might recognize the term activation function differently as an FI curve, as a response function, as a transfer function, exactly the same thing. Something that takes inputs and turns them into outputs. So in model neuron-like units, there's many different varieties of, of these types of models that you can build. They can be discrete time models. They can be continuous dynamics models, such as rate-based models, in which each neuron, which I've idealized here, can produce, instead of producing digital zero and one spikes, actually produces an analog continuous variable or a firing rate, 
You can have spiking neurons that have the biophysics to produce digital spikes. They also communicate with one another with spikes. And there's much more recent varieties that neuroscientists like me have borrowed from machine learning. And that includes model neuron-like units such as gated recurrent units, LSTM units, and so forth. But all of these are model neuron-like units. For today's lecture, we're going to be focusing on continuous dynamics or rate-based networks. And the reason for this is as follows, right? What I want you to understand is that these models have essentially one equation that rules them. And you want to understand the simplicity and the mathematical elegance that makes the foundation on which more biophysical reality can be put in, such as spiking dynamics, such as more rich biophysics and so on. So for today, we're going to be restricting ourselves to continuous dynamics rate-based networks in which the, the essential unit of computation is a neuron-like unit that makes firing rates or a continuous analog variable rather than spikes. Now, in addition, there's activation functions, which I hinted to you as taking in some input and producing an output. Those can be linear or nonlinear. And in the nonlinear class of activation functions come very many varieties. And I've only listed like four here. They can be hyperbolic tangents, which look like a, which are kind of a variety of sigmoids that saturate. They can be ReLU or rectified linear units, which people among you that have studied machine learning will be familiar with. They can be piecewise linear, they can be sigmoids and so forth. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing linear versus nonlinear networks. And within nonlinear networks, for mathematical convenience, we're gonna be talking about hyperbolic tangents, uh, which I've written here as tang or tan h as the function. So what this tan h will do is take in an input current and turn it into a firing rate. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And the reasons for why we're picking the hyperbolic tangent and why we're picking the type of model that we're building will become evident as I go on. Right now, I'm just setting the table for y'all. The third element here, so what I've drawn here in the schematic are just disjointed neuron-like elements just sitting there in a the bath. Clearly, the word neural networks implies that these model neuron-like units are interacting with one another. And that's the third building block that we're looking at. And these interactions can come in varieties, right? Every neuron can talk to every other neuron in the network, a configuration known as a fully connected one. They can be talking to a few neurons in a distant dependent manner. They can be only, there's a probability of connection that can vary from, you know, 0.001 to 100%. They can be sparse. They can also be structured in different ways. So for example, the same recurrent neural network model could be parceled out into different modules or interacting multi-area configurations. It can have distance dependent um, fall off of connectivity. It can have excitatory and inhibitory cell types making different types of connections. It can have gap junctions. I mean, the interactions governing the properties of neural network models are diverse. Today, just to keep things simple, we're going to be talking about fully connected random, uh, fully connected recurrent neural network models. So these are our building block, continuous rate-based dynamics units, um, activation functions that are, we'll be discussing the difference between linearity and nonlinear networks. Within nonlinear networks, we'll be talking about saturating dynamics governed by the tan H function. We're going to be talking about fully connected networks. Right. So, so let's let's write down something, right? Like let's write start to write down a theory of what governs um, mathematically these types of um, of model units. So imagine there's a neuron that is sitting in a bath, right? I've tagged it as neuron I. Um, I do have a question for the moderator. There's like a bunch of stuff in the chat. Am I paying attention to that? Because I can't see it. Occasionally it'll let say me, something. Let me let me uh, yeah. um, tell you the question. Mm -hmm. uh, Really has a question. If we work with rate models, is it possible to capture the temporal coding? Uh, the spike to a certain extent. To a certain extent. Like SD, yeah. To a certain extent. But if you want to talk about things like spike synchrony and so forth, you can't, not with analog dynamics. Was that it? Is it clear? You so, can ask. So, yeah. So, uh, my question is more like, uh, so if the read model cannot capture uh, temporal coding or STDP, is that like a, still a valid model? Uh, yes. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, like 
there's many people arguing those those aspects are important, right? So what they are, are. Why, why, are the, why are the reasons that we're like working with model that doesn't capture this? Like, so uh, I didn't why? say they don't, they do so to a limited extent, right? So what you're about to see here is, a, is that essentially everything that you need to know mathematically all the way from you know what I'm about to describe all the way to eigenvalue spectra of these types of networks mean field calculations all of those are very well defined in the continuous domain when you go into spiking dynamics I view spiking dynamics as a biophysical detail that rides on top of this so starting with spiking dynamics for the purposes of today's didactic lecture is kind of backwards to me um, further, a lot of data that I work with, right, in my own lab comes from, you know, calcium imaging experiments. Um, I work with human data, which comes out of ECOG and LFPs. Those are continuous signals. So there's a class of problems for which temporal coding, like spike, spike synchrony, or STDP. STDP, by the way, has been extremely well characterized even in the continuous domain. So, um, I mean, even though it is spike timing dependent plasticity, the actual abstraction runs through what I'm about to tell you. I see. Yeah, thanks very much. Of course. So the way that we're going to be defining um, a lot of biophysical detail for this one particular model, let's say there's a neuron eye that's sitting in a bath of other neurons, right? Now, let's say somebody in its presynaptic environment fired a spike, or let's say you put a glass electrode in this neuron eye and injected some current into it, right? What happens in that circumstance is a lot of channels open, currents flow into the cell, lots of biophysics occurs, but we can simplify that biophysics into just saying that the current in the model neuron is described by a first order differential equation. So we're, we're abstracting away a lot of biophysics and we're defining the current as a solution to this first order differential equation that for, for the ith neuron is dx dt is with a leak minus i. Now the solution to this equation can be plotted like this, right? So this is the solution xi as a function of t. If you assume that the current at time zero is one, then the activity in this, neur in this neuron, this isolated neuron just decreases and exponentially to zero. Now I can control how fast this decreases to zero by introducing a variable tau in this equation, right? So all I've done is now introduce very quickly in this kind of simple mathematical framework, the concept of a synaptic time constant. So by tweaking this parameter tau, you can figure out how fast this should decay. But ultimately, the time course of this leaky model neuron is kind of boring meaning it just decays away to zero at long term. So it's not doing a lot, right? Now, if this neuron did not have a leak, however, it would still be an exponential, except it will be unstable and it will explode with the same exponent that I put in over there. So the leak is kind of important to keep things stable. So where am I going, right? A linear model in the neuron is either super stable and kind of boring or zero or unstable and blows up. And I want you to put a pin in this particular thought that I just gave you. Now, if you didn't want the activity of this neuron to go to zero, right, this activity to go to zero, there are a few things you can do, right, because it's kind of boring for this activity to go to zero. You can introduce a constant current to this, to this neuron, right, which I'm going to call II. Now, if this is a constant value current, then instead of decaying to zero, the activity of this unit or the current in this unit will decay with the same exponent as the t over tau that you put in over there, but it's going to decay to a constant value given by the amplitude of the constant input, right? Now, this is a neuron sitting in a bath, not talking to anyone. Now, this neuron is typically an element in a recurrent neural network model. Right? So essentially, rather than the current in this model neuron being injected as a constant value from the outside, this II term is actually interactions from everybody else in the network. So remember what we tried to construct, right? We have model neurons that are connected to everybody else, right? Every neuron is talking to everybody else. So rather than II being a constant value, it really is everybody else presynaptic to me indexed by the letter J in this case, if I'm the ith neuron, everybody presynaptic to me is J. Their activity or their currents are given by the term XJ and they're weighted by how strongly every neuron J is coupled to me, I. 
And that's what the elements of this matrix JIJ indicate. So conventionally, JIJ is the, the weight of the coupling between every jth neuron and every ith neuron. So if there's n neurons in this network, and what we've done right now is very quickly write down a linear RNN model. Now, I already told you we're considering fully connected ones. And so the dimensionality of the, of the, um, of the matrix J from which each weight Jij is drawn is an N squared entity. And it can be succinctly mathematically described like I'm showing you in the schematic here, right? The columns all indicate the weights of a source. Um, they indicate like presynaptic neurons or sources and the, and the rows indicate postsynaptic neurons or targets. And this matrix can be written for pretty much any network. In the fully connected case, it's fully populated. So what we've done is written down a linear RNN. So what happens to the solution of this particular RNN, right? So linear RNNs, very much like the linear neuron that you saw before, also does two things. It can be either stable or unstable activity. Now, if it has stable activity patterns, it can decay to zero kind of boringly, or it can decay to zero by going through this type of damped oscillation. But ultimately, at long term, the stable patterns of activity produced by the, by the linear RNN are still going to zero at long term, or in this case, it's trivial fixed point. The unstable patterns, exactly like the neurons that you saw before, right, explode. So they can either explode directly, they can explode by going through an oscillation like a reverse of some kind of tennis ball from a tennis ball from hell, or it can explode by oscillating faster still. So in a linear recurrent neural network model, the stable modes are transient and the unstable modes are kind of uncontrollable. So where are we? We've built a recurrent neural network model. We've wired all the neurons up to everybody else. And there are interactions that are unfolding over time. So these are dynamics that are changing over time. But the dynamics aren't terribly useful to us as a model of the brain, right? So what are, where are we? So we're on our way to writing down a theory of cognition as dynamics. What we've done is write down a linear recurrent neural network model. I've taken dx dt and turned that into an x dot here just for, the, for fitting everything into the slide. What I've shown you is that a stable, um, that in a linear RNN, aside from notable exceptions that involve fine tuning the network in some ways, there are two activity patterns. There's a stable one that goes to zero or it's a trivial fixed point. Therefore, we've built ourselves a light bulb right? The light's off, the switch is off, there's a bulb, right? It's not on, nothing's happening. The problem here is that as soon as you flick the switch on, the activity that does not decay is unstable. It blows up, as you just saw. So how do we fix this? So the problem is that as soon as you fix, so it's not just the problem that we've modeled the brain like a light bulb. We've modeled the brain as a boring light bulb where the power's off. When the power's on, the bulb blows up. How do we fix it? Now, we have a few conveniences we can draw on, right? First of all, we can introduce the concept of nonlinearities. And that's what we're about to look at. Now, why do we want to play with nonlinearities? I can make a lot of arguments about how biological neurons have certain features that make it possible for us to conceive of nonlinearities. So, for example, biological neurons have refractory periods. They can't fire infinitely fast, right? Which means that they by and large, they saturate. By and large, they need a little capacitance to get going. Those types of features become convenient to us, right? So here we are. So we have ourselves a current in the model neuron, exactly the same equation as you saw before, where x dot is minus x plus j dotted into x, right? This is the linear model. Now, the conversion from linearity to nonlinearity relies on the fact that what I've stated here in terms of the linear RNN says, if I'm the ith neuron, my activity or my current depends on the presynaptic guy's currents, but that's not true. What happens in reality is the presynaptic guy has to fire before I ever sense anything, right? So the activity of me is actually governed by everybody else's firing rates rather than their internal channel properties right? Their channel properties and their presynaptic currents, I'm immune to unless I'm, I'm exposed to their firing rate. 
So there is a natural conversion from presynaptic current to presynaptic firing rate in this. And what we can do is replace this x with a tangent of x or phi of x. And that takes us from a linear network to nonlinear network in one step. So what I'm showing you here is the activation function phi of x as a function of x, which goes from minus one to plus one on the y axis are output weights or phi's on the x axis are inputs. So inputs are Sorry unbounded. For, Sorry for interrupting. Please. I didn't I didn't understand the, the, the jump from current to firing rate. Mm. Yeah, all I'm it. doing up there is replacing x with phi of x. Are you asking me why we're replacing x to uh, x from x to phi of x? Yeah, why the interpretation changes when you do that? Maybe. Well, the interpretation changes as a convenience for us. So the reason we want to go from linearity to nonlinearity is because linear networks are either boring or unstable. And we want to tame that instability. Right, and the way to tame that instability is to prevent the blow up by saturating something. Now we're using the convenience that neurons make outputs which other neurons are able to sense. That's why we're changing X to phi of X. Yeah, but this nonlinearity that you call phi, phi, phi of X is interpretable as working with a firing rate instead of yes. current? Yes. Okay. Presynaptic okay. firing rate. Okay. Okay. Right? Because that has J to is the have presynaptic our... guy. I am the I. Right? Oh, so okay. phi of XJ is the J neuron's firing rate. Okay. And firing rates behave that way. <laughs> firing Maybe. rates can behave that way. We're constructing okay. this. So we're completely driving this. So okay. in reality, firing rates can't go infinitely fast, right? Because neurons can spike, because neurons can't fire spikes on top of other spikes. Yeah. Because first it's energetically inefficient, and two, there's a refractory period. period. Like neurons will fire a spike, and then they have to take a break to, before they fire yeah. the next spike. So their firing so, rates are capped. Mm -hmm. Like in reality, you will hardly ever find neurons firing at like 100 hertz. So, I have a question. So that's why you want uh, there's to still a problem here, I think, is, is they're talking about the separation of time scale, right? You have this current immediately to this firing rate. Uh, what we normally say is there's, right, the currents to firing rate, there's another yeah. differential equation, but it's possible. Can... So, we're ignoring yes. synaptic yes. dynamics here, right? So, we're the J of J is a static entry here, it's one number, it's not J of T. Now, if I wanted synaptic dynamics here, then what I would imagine is that from the firing rate to my current, I will also have a dynamical system. But we're considering something very simple here because we're building up on it, right? So we're not considering synaptic dynamics except through this kind of tau in the, in the front of it. There isn't even a tau i, right? We're saying yes. there is one cellular capacitive time constant. Oh, We're constructing question, something simple. But the simple. question is, the question is whether the synaptic dynamics is fast enough to allow you to make such approximation, right? Here we mm -hmm. are. Here, that's the assumption, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I, I mean, that's the uh, assumption uh, we're making here: that the conversion from uh, from firing rate and from input current to um, firing rate is there is no it's it happens instantaneously. Yeah, actually, there are a lot of models that do yeah. that, um, like Certainly. working with instantaneous frequency. Yeah. Exactly. To Certainly. I mean, all of those things are possible, right? I mean, I'm setting the table here. So here are the assumptions we're going to be working with. And the reasons for that will become clearer, actually. So here, a... the actual problem that you should have is the fact that I'm allowing negative firing rates. Right now, if I assume that the firing rates as a function of input currents have the saturating feature, that's fine. I have a justification for that. But the tan H function is goes from minus one to plus one. Neurons don't ever fire negative firing rates. That's the problem you really should have. Now, what we're gonna say here is 
Wait for a few minutes while you see why tan H buys you this convenience, but everything I'm telling you so far doesn't have to rely on tan H, right? All the results I'll tell you so far, the math works out better if I use tan H, but if not, I can use a rectified tan H. I can use a one plus tan H over two, which goes from zero to one, or I can use a piecewise kind of piece together tan H also. But what we've done here, just by replacing this dot product j dot x by j dot phi of x, we've gone from linear neural networks to nonlinear neural networks relatively quickly, right? Yes, it involves assumptions. Yes, some of those assumptions don't capture all the richness of biology, but that's how you build models. Right? So there are a variety of nonlinearities that one can consider, right? So for example, let's just restrict ours. I mean, I listed like a whole lot in the beginning, but even if you say, let's assume saturating nonlinearities and why saturating nonlinearities, give me one more slide. Out of saturating nonlinearities, here's the, here's the hyperbolic tangent that I just showed you. Now its properties become super relevant in the arena of nonlinear RNNs and in, in, in a set of classic papers by Heim Sompolinsky, you know, many, many, many years ago. Um, he had shown why those networks lead to some good properties. You can also use a rectified hyperbolic tangent where you cap the firing rates over from zero to one. You could use one plus tang over two also, or you can use some Something far more realistic that you know I came up with many years ago, where relative to some maximum firing rate that you can choose, firing rates can still go from zero to one while maintaining some of the desirable properties that the hyperbolic tangent has. Like for example, the slope being a certain way or the maximum gradient being a certain way. ReLU has a specific problem in these cases because the nonlinearity is restricted to only one point in the function. So that doesn't really fall in this category. Um, but anyway, there are a few of these that you can use without qualitatively changing any of the results that I'm about to show you today. So what have I told you so far? We've gone from linear networks, which did boring things or blew up, to nonlinear networks by, by basically abstracting away a lot of the biophysics and assuming that there's a, there's a simplified nonlinearity to replace this input with. So the input due to recurrent interactions in this network is the second term, j dot phi, which we've introduced into these networks. So what happens in non-linear non RNNs, right? We have now essentially the building blocks that we were playing with. We've looked at, we've gone from linear to non-linear networks. What does the activity in these networks look like? Turns out the activity in, in non-linear RNNs is also transient and the activity that is not transient keeps going. So what do I mean by that? So there's two types of activity. The transient activity behaves exactly like the stable activity you saw in the linear case. So it can decay away to zero with an exponent. It can decay away with some kind of oscillations or damp oscillations, but at long-term, it's still kind of boring. The trivial fixed point is still at zero. The activity that is ongoing or the activity that is unstable, instead of exploding, becomes persistent or ongoing. So instead of exploding, like you saw before, it goes to a constant firing rate value or non-trivial fixed point in this case, or it can go to something that looks like oscillations, or it can exhibit very complex activity that is you know, rich and correlated over multiple time scales. And we can get into the details of that in a second. Now, non-trivial fixed points are observed experimentally, albeit in kind of um, artificial behavioral settings, like animals making saccades and so forth. You do find persistently active groups of neurons, but you know the evidence gets more and more tenuous as animal behaviors become more and more um, relaxed. Um, oscillatory activity is famous, needs no explanation, and rich ongoing activity oftentimes looks chaotic. And, you know, Heim Sompolinsky, again, in a landmark paper in 1988, showed that activity like this is actually chaotic in the thermodynamic world. But for our purposes, let's just call it rich and ongoing activity, right? So our building blocks have assembled a nonlinear RNN, right? So we have an activation function, which takes the currents and turns them into a firing rate by means of this function phi, which I have drawn here for you for convenience sake. It's also governed by the properties of this, of this matrix or the recurrent weights. 
right? So how strongly I fire depends on how strongly everybody else presynaptic to me fires, weighted by how strongly I am coupled to them, right? So if everybody upstream of me fires fivefold and they're coupled to me equally strongly, then all of my synaptic weights gain fivefold. But if they're weighted unevenly, then I don't strengthen all my synapses fivefold. And that's the strength of using a recurrent weight matrix. Now, remember where we're going with this, right? What we want to be able to do is to train network models like this to do something. So training network models essentially involves changing this weight matrix or changing the structure of this matrix to do something, right? Like dream like Heidi, like learn, remember, or decide, or actually match dynamics that is similar to experimental data recorded in Heidi the Optimist. All of that changes the structure of this matrix J. But in those structured cases that correspond to experimental data, there's nothing general you can say about those matrices because each of them is kind of specifically tailored to that particular biological example. There is a class of networks for which you can make some general mathematical statements, and that is the class of randomly connected networks. Now, nothing in the brain is really randomly connected, but at the end of today's lecture, I want to convince you that it's still the way of looking at randomly connected RNNs gives you powerful tools or intuitions that you can still apply to those structured networks. So what is something general that you can say about this class of networks, right? With the random connectivity, all we've done is impose that in one specific case, Let's assume that this neuron I is connected to all the neurons J through random weights. What that means is that each entry is drawn in an IID fashion from some distribution. Now here we can, for simplicity's sake, assume that there's one distribution, one Gaussian, in which the probability density as a function of interaction strength comes from some normal distribution. Now, in the case that has been studied the most famously, networks like this are balanced, meaning that they're centered at zero, mean is zero. You can impose that trivially in your, in your exercises by summing the rows to zero, for example. That is an abstraction to say, on average, every neuron receives the same amount of excitation and inhibition. The field is extremely divided on whether or not they think this is realistic approximation or whether this approximation changes based on the task you're studying. But for today's talk, let's assume that this is true. We can also pick the width of this distribution to be scaled as something. We're picking it to be scaled as G squared over N, where G or N is the size of the network. Therefore, G can be thought of as some scaling parameter. So I've studied this type of network a lot in my PhD. People like um, Heim Sopolinsky have studied it since the 80s. There are some properties of general models built in this fashion that become helpful to us. So what are those properties? Now, for, to construct a network like this, we can just assume that all the positive entries come from the right-hand side of this distribution. All the negative entries correspond to inhibitory synapses, and they come from the left of this, um, of this distribution. Let's assume that nobody's obeying Dale's law here. Again, the community is divided on whether or not excitatory and inhibitory neurons make only excitatory and only inhibitory synapses or not. And I will show you what happens when you do follow Dale's law in a second. But here, here, I'm just assuming everybody makes synapses willy-nilly, meaning if I'm an excitatory neuron, I can couple to this guy over there with inhibitory connections, that guy over there with excitatory connections, and the entries, the magnitudes are drawn from this distribution. So what happens, right? The, the mathematical convenience of building networks like this leads to some general properties. We already saw that networks like this can be spontaneously active. So let's say we take a network like this and we make its synapses less variable. In other words, we're just reducing the scaling parameter of the standard deviation here. And we, let's say we assume G of 0.9 or G less than one. A network like this is kind of boring. In fact, turns out that here's the activity of a single randomly picked um, RNN unit from a simulation, and its firing weight sits at zero. These networks are sometimes known as subcritical networks. 
Now, this is an inactive network. It's boring, completely indistinguishable from a linear network. So the adding of the nonlinearity, playing this drama, and you might as well have had a single neuron sitting in a dish. Now, in the same network, if you take the synaptic strengths and make them more variable, or in other words, take the distribution and make it broader by scaling this G parameter and making it bigger than one, a network like that is actually super critical, and a network like that becomes spontaneously active. And here's the firing rate of one such unit in a network like this with supercritical synapses that actually becomes, um, becomes active like this, spontaneously active. Now, in the thermodynamic limit, n tends to infinity, Heimson, Polinsky, uh, Crisanti, and Summers, and Stein, those guys showed that this type of activity is not just spontaneously active and rich, but it's technically chaotic. For our purposes, everything we do is still in the finite size case because you know we can only simulate network CA big. So suffice to say that G gives us this one knob, right? So now what we have done is gone from linear to nonlinear networks, and we have this one scaling parameter G, which we can tweak to go from inactive and boring networks to kind of rich, spontaneously active networks. Right? So in the population case, what used to be boring hundreds of neurons as a function of time that just sat there like a light bulb with a switch off, now becomes spontaneously active. So this is reflective of ongoing activity that is independent of the input in networks just by changing the synaptic variance. So I do say on one hand that this is one knob, this one number in this network that I've changed, but really I'm making a subtle point. Right, so a plasticity mechanism in life, right? Plasticity mechanisms are typically in the class of excited, you know, LTP like plasticity mechanisms or LTD like plasticity mechanisms. Sorry to interrupt, excuse me. Yeah. I would like to ask um, the connections are drawn from a, from a prob probability distribution, right? Yes. But they change over time. They are drawn dynamically from that distribution. They are not maybe? changing over time. Remember, JIJ is not a function of time. You're populating them independently and identically from the distribution. And then okay. you're running the network forward by integrating that differential equation. Once J is set, it's set. Changing of J involves training or it involves plasticity. We're, we're not doing that. J of J is not JIJ of time. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, but um, for saying something about this, you would have to run the model a lot of times, right? And taking means maybe, I don't know. Not in this case, right? A spontaneously active network is active always. Yeah. Right, it's just spontaneously active. As soon as G goes over one, a network like this is spontaneously active forever. In fact, if you try to average this activity, you won't get a whole lot. Right, let's say you take this activity, run it for 10 years, and then you chop up the data and you decide to average over it, it's super uncorrelated. In fact, you'll see that measure in two slides. You won't get very much. In fact, in the thermodynamic limit, this network is actually chaotic. So there aren't any long-term correlations here for you to speak of. So there are like 29 things in the chat. Should I worry about it at all or just ignore it? Well, I think- No, we... no, I'm, uh, I'm answering some of the questions. Yeah, okay. it, it's fine. Mm. Great. So really what I've told you is I'm, I'm making this kind of weird statement here, right? I've told you, here is the effect of changing the G parameter. If, you, if G is less than one, networks are boring and trivial. G greater than one, you get spontaneous activity, which is amazing and rich because it's got all of this, you know, there's not one particular frequency. It's just kind of reverberating forever. So you've got richness in this network. But the effect of G is really not um, a plasticity mechanism that is intuitive. Right? If I say, oh, LTP, this group of synapses, then that means you're taking this entire distribution and moving it rightward towards stronger connections. If I say, oh, LTD, these connections, then you take this distribution and move it leftward towards weaker connections. Changing of G actually implies changing the variability or the standard deviation of these synapses because the mean is still zero. So what I'm doing is saying, take a few synapses over here and make them strong, take a few synapses over here and make them weak. 
So I'm talking about kind of a dirty manipulation. Really data that people stick into supplemental materials, right? This kind of like mechanism, if you want to imagine, would, that would change G. But it's still uh, in the, from the perspective of the model, a simple thing to change. Oh, Udi has a question for you. Interesting. Yes, I heard. Yeah, very sorry to interrupt. So there, yeah, no, please. Uh, so I have several several questions. So the first please. one is, uh, uh, so does it results like only depends on like the hyperbolic tangent activation function, right? So if we change activation to other kinds, yep. do we still see this kind of result? Yes, and the like, answer is yes, except not at g of one. So if you use uh, one plus tangent over two, g of one won't work anymore. This is why see, this, was a, this was a convenience. In fact, one more slide and you'll see why. I see another question is like, mm -hmm. what is the in interpretation uh, if the, like the hyperbolic tangent has a like uh, value lower than zero, right? What, what's the, if we interpret that as a, like fire rate, like, I can tell you. So yeah. <laughs> we think of this as relative to a background. So we think of zero and minus one not as negative firing rates, but relative to a background firing rate. That's the I most see, commonly I, yeah. used justification. Uh, got it. Thanks. But really, all of the results I'm telling you about right now will hold if you use this kind of weird activation function, the one on the right which has the properties you're looking for, right? Firing rates going from zero to a certain max, you can even pick a different max for each neuron in your population. Yeah, thanks for the but clarification. The, but you yeah. see this weird and wacky one becomes hard to actually calculate, right? Like it was great and all at, you know, 11 years ago, but now I'm like, do I have to calculate its stability and like that? And not, not, not a huge fan, that's why. So I just kind of keep going with, uh, with hyperbolic tangent. But yeah, the I G see. of one result relies on, um, in fact, you should, you guys should try it as part of the problem set. So I can circulate a problem set, but there's, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. But one of them actually does involve this exercise. Um, these are ridiculously easy to simulate. It's literally the steps I'm telling you about now. And you can test for yourself. So if you try one plus tangent over two, G of one is no longer the line of stability. So then it, it like increases to something like two and a half in some cases and based on network size even further. So then it's not as, you know, neat to explain. Right, so this is something that you've seen before, right? Okay, got it, here we are. Right, so increasing G, meaning making synaptic distribution more variable or having more variable synapses gives you richer dynamics from these networks. Now, you also want a measure of this kind of richness, right? Yes, in the spontaneously active case, you can go and compute Lyapunov exponency and yada, yada, but boring. Now, imagine you want to be able to do something with data, right? Or let's say you want to compute a quantity with a network that has been fit to data. In that case, you want a quantity that empiricists or experimental collaborators of ours can resonate with. And that quantity is the um, average autocorrelation. Why? Okay, hold on. This is a GIF that is supposed to play, but it never plays. So I always have to unshare it and play it for you. And this is a GIF that was made by Sydney Smith at UCSD. Very kindly, she contributed this to my talk um, after I gave it at UCSD. And she was like, look, I made a GIF of this thing. So anyway, what this shows you is you've taken the firing rate of every unit in the network, multiply it with its firing rate a certain time later, like a lag, average over time and average over neurons. And that gives you a population measure that rather than being a function of two times is a function of tau just the delay or the average of the correlation. This thing, you can actually compute for, for data, you can compute for your network, and you can also compute it for your uh, chaotic network that I've just shown you. And that's the plot on the top right is the average of the correlation as a function of time lag for these two traces here. So now let me go back to playing it. The GIF will stop playing, it's a whole thing. So this quantity can actually be applied to the exact same example you saw before. So here's a network, right, whose individual neurons I've shown you before. The case in the row below is a subcritical network with G less than one. The case above is G greater than one. 
So if you look at the average autocorrelation, the boring network, you expect to have done nothing. So C of tau as a function of tau sits at zero. We have no issues with it. The spontaneously active, rich, ongoing dynamics network has this interesting shape. C of tau as a function of tau goes to zero at long delay. But it doesn't start with a delta function at zero. It starts with this kind of slow decay to zero. And that slow, like the, the value of C of tau at zero is actually the intrinsic chaos. And this slow decay to zero is a function of the rate dynamic. And this is also a hand wavy, not as rigorous as Lyapunov exponent, but a real signature of chaos. So if you have, so this is all the results I'm showing you today is from networks that are about 500 or 1,000 units big, I think 1,000 units big. And for that network, the C of tau is what I'm showing you here, right? It's a very clean drop down to zero. And that indication at, at, at zero delay that's internally generated ongoing activity, sometimes known as noise, but that's a different variety of noise, not like stochastic noise or amplifier noise, but it's internally generated spontaneous activity. Right, so where are we? We're back to our road to writing down this theory of uh, cognition as dynamics, right? We saw that linear networks have certain strengths, but the problem is that the stable activity is very boring and the activity that did not decay was unstable and blew up. So how do you tame this instability? How do you keep the light bulb from blowing up every time you turn the switch on? We introduced nonlinearities. We looked at the specific example of, ta of tan H, and we have, lo and behold, nonlinear RNNs. We looked at what happens in nonlinear RNNs in, in the face of random connectivity or random J matrices. And in that network, you tamed the instability that you had with the exploding light bulb that the, that the first network was facing, and you get rich dynamics. So what we've built is a lava lamp. So we've built this amazingly nice network that can produce rich dynamics in the absence of anything. Are we done, right? Is this done? Have we captured Heidi in all her dream and complexity? Answer, no. The reason is because the dynamics that you get from a network like this are chaotic. They're high dimensional chaos, not like the Lorenz attractor, but they're chaotic nonetheless, which means that they have two problems. Every time you do run this network, you will get a different activity pattern. They have repeatability problems and they have reliability problems. So in the case of randomly connected networks, yes, you get rich dynamics, but those dynamics are not great when you want to do something reliable and repeatable with them. So how do we fix it? Eventually, in Friday's lecture or Saturday's lecture, whenever you guys are up next, you'll see how we change the J so that we solve this reliability repeatability problem. But today I'm gonna to show you a different solution to this. Now, back to this, and we're gonna take a small, deeper dive into the math behind these networks so you can get a deeper intuition and I'll tell you the solution to this problem. But uh, I want to offer up a chance to either take a break or ask questions and then take a break or something like that. Yeah, we can have a break now. Yeah. So, and we can come back maybe in 10 minutes. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah, great. So it is 8.54 p.m. my time. Do you want to come back at? Um, nine, uh, nine, 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 four. nine, ten, yeah. like that. nine, four, yeah. God, 34 things in the chat. Uh, it's okay. I've been answering questions and making comments. So okay, wonderful. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, should I panic? Should no, I no, 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 no. You, you're you're perfectly clear, but we're I'm just answering. I'm making some general statements about please know, the, the power of the also, theory, right? So perfect. And if you wouldn't yeah, yeah. mind, um, is this being saved? Is the chat being saved? I think the chat can be saved, right, Trent? Um, I don't know. This is something that I don't. This is technical, so technical issue. I think so. Us are it not says technical. File people. here, right? Yeah. yeah. You see how near your name in the chat window it mm -hmm. says file. Ah, oh, okay. So we can we can file it for you. Have yeah, if you wouldn't mind, that would be exactly. great. Exactly. Exactly. I think when I lecture too, really I need great. to know Thank the you. questions. Yeah. Yes, there is exactly. a text file of all of the chat. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Shabchi. Awesome. Shabchi. All right. All right. Okay. See you all break. in 10. <laughs>
Yes, maybe we can resume the lecture. Thank you. Do you want to give it a minute? I don't think everyone's back. Maybe they are. Is there any question that you want to directly ask Professor Kanaka? Okay. Yes, please start. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back to our building blocks slide. Give me one sec. All right, everyone see this okay? Yes. <laughs> All right, so before we, um, before we took a break, um, you know, we looked at some of the building blocks um, that make up our nonlinear recurrent neural network model. And now I want you to, and, and then we also looked at the specific case of what happens when you wire all the neurons up to all the other neurons through random interaction weights or, you know, entries that are drawn from a Gaussian. So let's look at this in you know, a few more slides so you understand why it is that we're bothering with the specific class of networks, right? So we looked at activation functions that convert the current into a firing rate, the function phi, the properties of this recurrent weight matrix, specifically from the perspective of random, um, of random networks on which, an, of, on which a lot of foundational work has been built. And I showed you what happens when you build these network models by connecting them through Gaussian IID interactions action weights, right? I told you that in nonlinear RNNs, specifically those with random interaction weights, the dynamical patterns are either decaying or ongoing. And in fact, in the thermodynamic limit, the ongoing dynamics appeared to be, um, to be chaotic. Right? So what I've shown you here is that there are stable or transient patterns, which are indistinguishable from, um, from the linear case. And to really understand where they come from, we're going to start to draw on the kind of diagram that you see appearing on the right. So we can look at these spectral properties of the matrix J. Right? So there's essentially two features um, of these networks that are playing with one another. The type of nonlinearity that one uses and properties of the connectivity matrix, like the G that we use in these networks, or the variability of the synaptic weights in this random connected network. The persistent or ongoing activity patterns correspond to spectral patterns that appear there on the right. They can be persistent or ongoing in terms of trivial fixed points that are still constant firing rates. They can be oscillatory or they can even be chaotic. The last trace here should really be chaotic, but in this example, because it's a finite size network, you still found something that looked oscillatory. Right? There's a line here that you see here in the spectral plot. Right, That line indicates the transition at which dynamics go from boring or transient and stable at long terms at zero to something interesting or persistent and ongoing. And that is known as the line of stability. And it can change based on the properties of this network. So in, it turns out that in networks like this, looking at the eigenvalue spectra of, of the connectivity matrix, or in some cases, the stability matrix, actually, you can pause here to ask me the difference between those two objects. 
if you use a hyperbolic tangent, then the stability matrix comes out to be the same as the connectivity matrix. So that's another convenience of using the hyperbolic tangent actually. So the eigenvalue spectra of the, of the connectivity matrix becomes key towards understanding the types of activity patterns you get. So here's the network that we looked at before, right? Its connections came from this particular Gaussian. Now, it turns out that if you take a network like this with a thousand units in it, the matrix has n squared elements or a thousand squared entries in it naturally. But if you do an eigenvalue decomposition of this network, of the, of the connectivity in this weight matrix, you get a circle in the complex plane. So doing the eigenvalue uh, decomposition of this, um, of, this, of this matrix gives you n numbers. So you can think of eigenvalue decomposition as a dimensionality reduction technique of sorts. This net, this, there are complex numbers. So each number is associated with a real part and an imaginary part. The real part corresponds to the lifetime of the particular mode, like whether or not it decays depends on the magnitude of the real part of that number. And the imaginary part governs the frequency of that particular mode. So if you see an oscillation from the network, you can predict its, predict the frequency of the oscillation by looking at how high up it's on the y-axis. There's n of these numbers, and they're symmetric about the x-axis here, right? Because uh, complex numbers come in conjugate pairs. So now there's, it turns there's out, another questions on the chat, I guess. In the autocorrelation slide, is decreasing autocorrelation reflects chaotic states or just a non-zero dynamic system, right? Chaotic state. So for for if the if the autocorrelation function goes to zero at long lag, it's chaotic. And rate chaos is distinguishable from low dimensional chaos. And this becomes key here. Now, if you were looking at the Lorenz attractor, for example, three different three coupled differential equations, that is low dimensional chaos. This particular variety of chaos is known as high dimensional chaos. It looks like chaos, like any other chaos, um, positive Lyapunov exponents, sensitivity to initial conditions, sensitivity to noise and unreliability, but it's high dimensional chaos. And the reason for that becomes clear in one more slide, but it's chaos. So now imagine that you, you, know, you want to put in a little bit more realism into these networks, right? Let's say that rather than making synapses that can be both excitatory and inhibitory, you want to restrict yourself to excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, namely Dale's principle, or in other words, that each entry in the, in the matrix comes from magnitudes that are still random, but there's column-wise sign restriction. What this means is that I pick a certain neuron and call it inhibitory, which means all of its connections that it makes will be negative in sign. The magnitudes can still be drawn randomly, or in other words, they can come from this distribution over here to the left of zero, and the other units or the other, other neurons in the network can come from this distribution over here with positive entries. The magnitudes themselves can be randomly assigned. So this is the simplest way to introduce cell types in your network. Now imagine in the continuum limit, right, you have many distributions like this, even potentially one per each unit, right? Each neuron can have its own distribution. But let's keep this simple. Now in that case, the circle of eigenvalues becomes non-uniform. And this was something that we showed in, um, in, my, in my PhD work. And what happens is that what used to be a uniform circle in the complex plane has the central high density area followed by a more uniform disk outside. The radius of these eigenvalues in the first case is G, which is convenient because if you scale the variance of the synaptic distribution as g squared over n, that's why g of 1 becomes your point at which the trivial fixed point is unstable. It's the radius of eigenvalues that governs whether or not you get dynamics from this network. If the radius is less than 1 here, right, then there are no unstable eigenvalues at all because the, the line of stability is at 1. The point of this slide is to say that this non-uniformity can lead to some very interesting properties in these networks. And in fact, when, you, when, when somebody here asked me about spiking networks earlier, right? In spiking networks, it's been rigorously shown that heterogeneity in cell types 
actually leads to desirable properties. So Nicola Brunel is a scientist you wanna look at the papers of, also Dan Goodman. They've both built very beautiful um, spiking neural network models that also study the properties of different cell types and um, cell types in, in, in spiking dynamics. Anyway, so the eigenvalue spectra change when you have excitatory and inhibitory synapses. And in this case, if you pick the variance of these distributions to be the average of both, then the radius still comes out to be proportional to this, which means that the radius is still the effective G at one. So the line of stability doesn't change with excitatory or inhibitory synapses. So once again, this answers, I think maybe Fernando's question, um, which said, is it, is it more the, the sensitivity to um, nonlinearity that affects G of one or not? And, and the answer, one of them is here. Right, so what, what, why do you get chaos by making interactions more variable, right? And I've given you the answer up there. It's like skinny and fat histograms. So let's take an example right here. The, the, there's a line of stability is at G of one, right? I've drawn them both in this gray thing here. Now the activity of an RNN model neuron for a network with G less than one is kind of at the trivial fixed point or boring or at zero, right? So that's the circle of eigenvalues. None of the eigenvalues have real parts greater than the line of stability. So this network is basically showing you nothing but a trivial fixed point. Everybody's sitting at zero. Why zero? It's because a trivial fixed point of the hyperbolic tangent with this is, is at zero, right? Excuse me, I would like What's to ask something. Thing? Please. Yeah. Um, well, I, I should have asked this before, but um, we are saying that the scaling factor, this G, actually determines the dynamics. Yes. Yeah? But every, every time we draw the connections, we get some different matrix because of Correct. the distribution, right? Yeah. So that the fact that that G is defining some something is actually very strong. I yes. mean, maybe every time that you run the, the, well, every time you could get something different. Yes. Is it true that G is determining with the... the really the, good question. So G is the universal hyperparameter in these models in the thermodynamic limit meaning in very large networks. So in these networks, there's a property known as self-averaging, which is kind of what you're getting at. So in finite size networks, every time I draw the random matrix and connect this network, you can find a random configuration in which G is not exactly at one, right? Like the circle of eigenvalues can have a, a few eigenvalues here and there. That's called a finite sized effect. And that effect becomes smaller and smaller as networks become larger and larger. So for example, even with networks that have a thousand units, which you can run on literally my laptop very, very quickly in real time, those networks will still show you this behavior. But if you give me a network that has like 300 neurons, right? That network from realization to realization will have a lot more noise. Like occasionally I'll find a network that becomes trivial, even if I make Jeeves 1.5. But you play with large enough networks, and then this becomes tighter and tighter. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's kind of cool. And in fact, you will see right now in the next sentence why this is true. So if you have G greater than yeah. 1, you see that the circle of eigenvalues has a big radius, which means that all of these eigenvalues with real parts greater than 1, everybody in this chord area, right, that has so area of the circle under this cord has become unstable, right? Now it's a nonlinear network, meaning each eigenvalue here corresponds to a certain frequency of a mode that never decays. If there was just one eigenvalue that was unstable, the entire network would oscillate with that frequency. But there's all of these that are unstable. And since it's a nonlinear network, they couple together and they couple together to give you chaos. Now there's another theorem, which sounds like the name of kind of some kind of syndrome that you have, Newhouse, Ruel, Takens theorem, that essentially says if you have anything more than three of these frequencies in a nonlinear network, it's guaranteed to go towards chaos. So it's a statistical physics kind of theorem, but you can see this. So let's say you take a network of a thousand neurons, right? And you make G greater than, let's say you just make G of exactly one. 
every once in a while by accident, you have a network that has maybe one little eigenvalue sticking its nose out and you will see oscillations immediately. As soon as G becomes 1.1, 1.2, you'll start to see oscillations and chaos very, very quickly in these networks. And this is why. So essentially reservoir computing came from this idea, right? So you have all of this activity, right? which essentially is composed of all of these frequencies together. So if I did a power spectrum analysis of this network, it's kind of this squishy mess, power spectrum density as a function of frequency. So it's kind of this squishy mess. So it is composed of all of these component frequencies. And this is the reservoir. In reservoir computing, the reservoir comes from this idea that the dynamics are composed of all of these high dimensions. Do you see this is not three frequencies coupling, it's actually high dimensional chaos because it involves a superposition of all of these network nodes. So it's a different beast, it's a different kind of chaos. Right, and you can see that chaos in the population activity as well. I mean, there's no discernible pattern, yada, yada. Right, so increasing G richer dynamics and this gives you an intuition. Now you can ask me something here, right? This is where I will, you will, you, my back to the wall. Here's where, so this is a linear decomposition, right? We're looking at the stability of the system in linear case, but we're still talking about nonlinear networks. We're also saying eventually we're gonna train these networks to not be random at all, right? Nothing in the brain is really random. We're having connectomes come out physically and they are not random. So why is this analysis helpful? This analysis is helpful because you can do it in networks that have been fit to data. They never come out as a uniform circle, mind you. So I've played, so this is what I do now, right? My day job when I'm not lecturing is literally taking RNNs, training them to match data. And you'll see this on Friday as well. So I plot the eigenvalue spectra of the trained J matrices. They don't come out uniformly distributed, but if, there, if the network in real life has spontaneous activity, there's almost always unstable nodes. And there's always some shape to it. So for example, if a network were largely stable, had a maximum disk at 0.9 and had one unstable eigenvalue, which only real parts on this side, it would make a non-trivial fixed point. If it had a few modes, it would make oscillations. If it had these many modes, it would make chaos. So you can get an intuition because you can do these types of manipulations on networks that have been fit to data, but the foundational elements still come from these types of idealizations, right? The idealization that you have a large network, the fact that these distributions come, that you, know, you can only get access to groups of synapses rather than individual synaptic weights and so on. Now here's the population measure again, right? There's internally generated activity that has this high dimensional chaos feature at uh, tau equals zero and at long term it goes to zero. Somebody here had asked me a very good question about the decay time of the C of tau. Is it governed by the time constant that you put into the network or is it governed by G? The answer is it's governed by G and here's why. So if in a thermodynamic limit, I say, I want to calculate this spontaneously active chaotic network has some kind of time scale associated with it, right? Like, what is that time scale? I can look at it and I can analyze it by computing the area under this cord. Like, what is the area of the circle under this cord? Turns out that it scales as G to the two thirds power. It's just you know standard formula and then I apply it to the network and G of two thirds power, right? That is what sets the time scale of this. Now, if I were to do this entire exercise with spiking dynamics, spiking dynamics, you wanna look at not this kind of slow chaos because the, the digital one zero spikes will um, whiten this kind of slow down at the onset of chaos. It doesn't give you the slow time constant. The only thing I put into this network was a 10 milliseconds in the tau in the very beginning, right? So you get much slower dynamics just by increasing the G. Right, so where are we? So on the, on the route to uh, theory of cognition and dynamics, we saw linear networks, we saw the role of nonlinearities, we saw what happens if you have random coupling, and you saw that we have a problem. 
The problem is that the spontaneous activity we get from these networks are chaotic. So they have a reliability and a repeatability problem, right? Which is what we just saw here before. Every time I run this network because of infinite uh, sensitivity to very small changes, you get something completely different. So Heidi the octopus is not gonna reliably eat her crabs. So this is a problem. We're gonna talk about changing this random J matrix into something much more specialized later. But today, here's an intermediate solution. The intermediate solution is what happens when you take this kind of network and you put inputs onto it? Turns out that putting inputs onto a network like this gives you the best of both worlds. Gives you the mathematical tractability for free, which is why we're bothering with all this anyway. But it also makes the state of this network much more reliable. And let's see how that works. So here we are, back, mm -hmm. to, the, back to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, uh, how does the autocorrelation function changes with uh, G? The larger, uh, the larger the G, uh, the, the sharper or the... Oh, that's right, because the larger the G, the more the higher frequency components will be in the reservoir, because now the circle will be bigger and you'll have more imaginary eigenvalues that contribute to a higher frequency in the dynamics. So that decay will become faster as a function of G. Okay, thank you. So here we are, right? We've, we've assembled this, this building block set, and now we're gonna add another feature to it, a twist, inputs. So inputs can be periodic. They can be noisy in these types of models drawn from different distributions of noise, different colored noise. They can also be naturalistic. People have looked at you know, uh, networks responding to naturalistic images, to naturalistic movies and so forth. But we like sines and cosines here because we can do the math with them. So today I'm gonna to be talking about what happens if you take this continuous rate-based network with hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity, everybody's connected to everybody else, and you put on periodic inputs onto it. So what happens to these dynamics? So here's our building block set back again. You've seen all of this before, except now in this equation, every neuron also receives an external input given by HI. And I'm gonna stick to cosine and every neuron gets the exact same input because remember, we're trying to understand a simple framework first, but we wanna understand it thoroughly. So every neuron in this network gets the same amplitude of the input, gets the same input of the same frequency. The only thing that is different, just to keep things interesting, is I'm going to give everybody a random phase of this cosine. So that's the schematic for you up there. Everybody gets the same exact cosine input with the same frequency. The only thing different is the phase of this drive. So let's see what happens when you put this input onto networks like this. So here's, the, here's a non Here's a zero input case. This is something you've already seen before. Activity of a randomly connected RNN model neuron. Input amplitude is zero. You get chaos from this network. Here is one example firing rate as a function of time. Now, when you put on weak inputs onto this network, weak periodic inputs, the network keeps churning on, right? I can kind of maybe hallucinate that it slowed down a little, maybe, but not really, right? It's kind of doing what it's doing. When the input exceeds a certain critical amplitude, the network undergoes a phase transition. And we'll look at the properties of this phase transition in a second. But what happens is that it turns out its ongoing intrinsically generated background noise and everybody in the network becomes entrained to the frequency of the drive. So now here's an example neuron who's firing with the exact same, amp the exact same frequency as the frequency of the drive. And here are the network parameters here for you. And there's some wiggles because it's a nonlinear network. And you can kind of see that effect as input amplitude increases, there's this phase transition. So here is the spontaneous dynamics case. Again, the same few hundred neurons as a function of time. Now in the thermodynamic <laughs> limit, the top thing the would be chaotic. Yeah. The frequency is of the Two input, and a half hertz. Right? Sorry? The input. The input yeah. has the frequency. Yes. What? Okay. That input has that frequency. So, so I times cosine omega t is the omega is, uh, is that is that 2.5. Okay. 
Now, after the phase transition, input generated dynamics have this kind of ladder like pattern, right? Now, it's not exactly synced up because I'm giving everybody a random phase, right? If everybody was synced up with the same exact phase, this network would be epileptic, right? Everybody's oscillating back and forth to saturation and down. That's not what's happening here, right? This is not terribly interesting. Yes, the network is paying attention to the input, but again, it's only doing this. The really interesting regime is the one in the middle where you're hovering just close to the transition. In this dynamics, you have two features, right? You have a portion of the activity that is spontaneously active and dynamic and rich because you have all of this internal state in your brain, right? And you have some portion of the activity that comes from the external drive. To me, this is the most interesting regime that forms the substrate on which real networks might operate. Because you're not doing hallucinatory oblivion here. You're not doing reflexive entrainment here. In fact, you're in this interesting regime where you kind of have both. How do you quantify this, right? Now, I'm telling you to use the eyeball method of computational neuroscience. But you can actually quantify it by looking at the same exact average autocorrelation measure that we saw before. It's a population-wide measure, right? Taking the firing rates of everybody, multiplying it by firing rates a certain time later, averaging over neurons and time, and you get C as a function of tau. The random phases that we gave the inputs to were not just me being clever. That random phase ensures that C still remains a function of tau rather than becoming some complex function of different time constants. So here's the, the non-input case, right? You've seen this before. C of tau is a function of tau. There's an initial high variance component in the correlation function that comes from this internally generated ongoing background. Once the network undergoes the phase transition, C of tau changes shape. So C of tau as a function of tau now becomes periodic. In that, at long term, it's no longer zero because obviously everyone is oscillating with the frequency of the input, right? So the amplitude at long term becomes the same as the amplitude initially, meaning there is no internal noise. All the activity comes from the external drive. The interesting regime, as I told you already, is the one in the middle where you kind of have both. And why is this interesting? Because at, at short delay, you still have this ongoing background at long time, you can still read out the external drive. And in fact, you can quantify this, right? You can call the, inter the, the zero lag activation or the, the height of the correlation function some kind of internal background noise. And you can call the long-term oscillation at the frequency of the input, the height of that you can call signal. So for people in the audience here that are engineers and physicists, this is awesome. Because you've taken a curve, you can, you can take this n by time um, plots that you can see in the middle, and rather than going through some complicated calculation of Lyapunov exponents, which are ill-defined, by the way, for the input-driven case, and you can extract from average autocorrelations a noise parameter and a signal parameter. And this is also something you can do with both empirical data as well as networks that have been fit to do something interesting. So let's look at how these quantities actually behave. So here's how the phase transition curve looks. The phase transition curve now is not a continuous plot, right? Now it is input amplitude as a function of input frequency. And there's a phase space with a line that divides this phase space. Below this line of transition is where the mixed regime lives, where there's ongoing and input driven dynamics where this average autocorrelation function has two different heights associated with it. Above this phase transition curve, you have input-driven periodic dynamics, right? And this was derived in a, in, a, in a set of papers that I was involved in a while ago. So this phase transition curve is instructive because it makes two predictions. And here's one. If I take the frequency of the, of the external drive in the network, right, and I keep cranking up the input amplitude, Let's say I'm playing everybody 2.5 hertz, and all I'm doing is increasing the input amplitude, I should expect to cross this phase transition curve once, right? Which is something you kind of already saw before. At a value of input amplitude equals input critical, you should be able to turn off your internal dynamics 
and pay attention to the input driven periodic dynamics only. And that's actually what you see here. And this becomes interesting. So on the right hand side, I'm showing you these quantities, right? The height at low lag of the correlation function I'm calling noise. You will see that plot in, in block circles. At long term, the height of that is the signal. You'll see that in open circles. And the one where the input above the input vertical has no noise. So I'm just showing you these to show you how we calculated these plots. So here's amplitude as a function of, um, of input amplitude, the response amplitude as a function of input amplitude. And you see that the signal portion of the activity, which is these open circles, grows linearly with input amplitude, right? Not a huge surprise, right? Because the network is essentially working like a wire here. The noise, however, is a very interesting shape. The noise goes to zero at the I critical. In fact, when the noise goes to I, I when the noise goes to zero at I critical, nothing spectacular is even changing in the signal. So really, the phase transition is one that is driven by the network turning off its internally generated activity and paying attention to the external drive. Now here's the other prediction that this phase transition curve makes. I can pick a certain input amplitude here, right? And I can crank up the frequency of the drive. So it's no longer 2.5 Hertz. I can sweep the frequencies from zero to 20 Hertz. Now, if that's the case, I should be expected to cross this phase transition curve twice. Or in other words, I would expect that there's a range of frequencies for which I'm above the phase transition curve and a range of frequencies for which I'm below the phase transition curve and stuff is still noisy. And that's actually what we see here. Once again, open circles are the signal and you can see it does what it does, right? Like, you know, there's a frequency sweep and it's behaving the way it behaves. The noise, however, which is the internally generated high dimensional chaos produced by this network goes to zero between three and seven Hertz, which is exactly that predicted by the model. Now, what this is saying is, let's say in systems like the barrel cortex, that there is an entrainment frequency or there's a range over which networks are most sensitive to external drive. Or in other words, networks are sensitive to statistics that match their own. So if I say that for a biological system, I should expect to cross the space transition curve from three to seven hertz, let's say, then by driving such a system with this kind of frequency sweep, you should be able to identify that range, right? Now, in real neurons, this is not the only source of noise. Background ongoing activity is not the only source of noise, right? Networks are exposed to noise that are stochastic right? External inputs can be stochastic. Another brain region somewhere can be injecting noise into it. In fact, LMAN is a system that is in the Songbird um, system that is famous for injecting different kinds of noise into the song system during development, but not afterwards. Now, if but that does that the require case, the, uh, that you right? actually activate all the neurons or just uh, subpopulations of neuron? Here is everybody. Yeah, but what if you just drive a small population of neurons? You get two coupled equations. Unsolved case, it's a research problem. So if you have two populations of neurons, I can tell you the preliminary results we have. And if you wanna run with it, happy to give you the project. Um, so if you have two populations, you have F times the driven population, plus one minus F times the population that is only recurrently connected to the driven population which means that there's two different equations, one that has an H in it and one that is driven by recurrence through the first equation, which means now you're calculating these types of mean field limits in those coupled cases. So you are following the dynamics of the driven population separately and the not directly driven population separately. And those appear to behave very differently based on what is the fraction of, net of, of units that are getting the drive, the nature of the drive, the frequency of the drive, the coupling, and that's it. But that's yeah, no good. one's actually like analytically solved it. I kind of vaguely played with it towards the end of my PhD and then was like, oh my God, too hard, I gotta graduate. But simulation is the easy, right? So. Yeah, so this was the four things I told you was the simulation bit. Mm -hmm.
so if it had, so if a network like this had stochastic noise, then rather than going to zero, it will kind of plateau at the bottom at some non-zero value. Uh, but yeah, the two population case, super interesting. Uh, but no one's actually analytically solved it. Um, it would be a gold mine if somebody did, honestly. I mean, somebody should. I would like, I would like to ask, what of these, which of these results you have obtained analytically and which numerically? I mean, the phase there are so many occur. things that I, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't even know how to attack here. Yeah. <laughs> So um, this, this, this transition that goes from, so the input driven, the non-input driven phase transition, right? Let me show you. Um, maybe it's the correlation function that shows up somewhere. So this result was analytic. So calculating the density of eigenvalues as a function of radius for the case where there's two different distributions for the same variance and not the same variance, that was analytic. And to solve this analytically, we had to set up an analogy. So we thought of this as particles in a field. So like charged particles in a field and set up that analogy, solve the problem in electrostatics and then brought it into neuroscience. So that was, that was one analytic solution. Um, and then there's this one, which shows you the average correlation function, right? This one. This one was solved by Heim, Sompolinsky, in, and the Summers and Crisanti and Stein, that team. That team showed that the average autocorrelation function went from flat to this kind of case. And they did this by setting up a mechanical analogy. So they said, can you imagine if there's a particle sitting on a hill? Right, And that particle has to flow down into a well. So they looked at potential in a double well potential here, like the, the position of a particle in double well potential. So this was also done analytically. Then I started my PhD and I did this piece partly analytically, this transition. So this transition where it goes from this kind of analogy to this mixed regime to this. And the reason to fully calculate it was complicated. It's because with the input, the potential itself changes. So when you're looking at a, the position of a particle and starting it at the peak of a double L potential, in the input not driven case, the potential is the potential, right? So you just have to figure out where to start the ball. The ball has to end up in one of the wells and you're done. In this case, where you start the ball will also influence the shape of the potential itself. So it had this like weird tautological feature. Does that make sense? So it became way too complicated, way too fast. So ultimately we had to solve it partly numerically by bracketing the solution. So we were like, okay, we'll start here, then we'll make a little perturbation around it. And then we'll overshoot that point and then undershoot, overshoot and found the starting point. But it's not the kind of thing that I could have done by the light of the moon, right? It's like the thing that actually needed a computer. So yeah, partly analytically is the answer. So there so are two, for other, example, questions. You... There are two other questions on the chat, maybe. Sorry, uh... Uh, can I take Fernando's second question and then you can tell me the other two? Wait, what sure. time was it? Yeah, for example, you find the critical values uh, numerically, like? So this is a numeric, so the phase transition curve also has an analytic equivalent. This, okay. this curve that I'm showing you right now is simulation. Okay. The non-monotonic phase transition curve was solved analytically. And then and this result that I'm showing you, that's why you see these discontinuities in these points, right? Because they're simulation results. Okay, and one another quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you have compared this with real connectomes, I think. I, 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 I don't know if I we are, listen I mean, well. Not really. We have fit these networks to data. Then we looked okay. at the features of their connectivity matrices of those fit networks. Okay. 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 But, you know, ours is the generation that's going to make the link, right, between actual connectomes and this type of network. So here's a problem that no one's done and really kind of should, is now that there are some connectomes that are out there, what happens if you initialize a network on that connectome? 
Like take the weight matrix as the J and run the dynamics. What even happens? Right? Well, like, I like, know. like maybe it. nothing happens, but I just want to know. You would like a connectome with a lot of nodes, right? Yeah. Close to the thermodynamic limit. Yeah. Maybe, but you know, it works. This thing works well with like, you know, 500 units. So whatever, right? You know, if it's 500 units, you're kind of batting close to, you know, maybe even C elegance. For C elegance, again, because of the problem that you first brought up, I might have to run a few networks or find one that was chaotic at G of one and then use that or something. But at least like the attempt should be made. So I have some comments about C elegance is the problem of the individual units can be much more complicated than this very simple tangent H model that you're presenting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm still curious. Like, yeah, exactly. What happens? Like, even that zero, I mean, if somebody were to tell me, look, I did this and it does nothing, I'll be happy. But like, somebody should at least try it. Anyway, you said there was other questions. Yes, there's one question in the chat. How about directly add external drivers without adding uh, a nonlinear to it? So, and this, this is the first question. So there's no, in a linear network, it's just gonna read it out like a wire, right? It's gonna, you know, that's what the first example was, right? Like it's not going to decay away to zero, but like stay at some constant value as long as the input goes on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the second question is why the threshold curve of critical external currents along frequency, it's not, um, is a curve that opens up. Pinjie, can you explain a little bit more? Yeah, I, I, don't I don't understand the question. This question. Pinjek, could you turn on the uh, the mon uh, microphone and uh, try to elaborate upon your question? Uh, I, I think, uh, so why the uh, curve on this light is just like a uh, kind of uh, not convex, right? It's just which, like which curve? This? Which curve? This one? This one that uh, yeah. Naka showed? So uh, yeah, why exactly. it is non-monotonic, it has a dip. Is that your question? Why is it non-monotonic? That's, that's the behavior of the system. So initially, what we, had, what we had actually found was that, so we did the frequency sweep, but we didn't do the low frequency sweep. So essentially what we had plotted was the right-hand side of this curve. And then it was like halfway through a PhD that Heim kind of came up and he was like, have you looked at low frequency expansions? And so when we did that part, it turned out to be a non-monotonic behavior like this. That's just the nature of the system. Now with a high G, right? If you had, this is for G of 1.5. If I made G of two, the smiley face curve that you see here moves upwards and rightwards towards higher input amplitude as well as higher frequency range, which makes sense because higher G implies that there's a bigger radius of eigenvalues that are unstable. Networks are more stable to statistics that match their own. Yeah. But it's this feature, right? It's the fact that you can turn inputs into these networks and get activity patterns that you can read out based on the input actually quantitatively, right? By looking at signal and noise, and you're not sacrificing rich ongoing dynamics, which you needed because networks in the brain are spontaneously active. That's the strength here. So we have at least one solution to the problem that we originally- I, I think Pinjir's question is probably, I, I guess is that she does not get the intuition that why uh, somehow in this one particular frequency, right, the noise was quenched. Um, it's a frequency range at which noise is quenched, not one value. Yeah, yes. Why right. this over this range that is quenched, right? So can you give us sort of a more, some, some more intuition that we can 
we can kind of understand it, like uh, some analogy to some other physical dynamics. So I'll tell you the analogy. So there is an analogy, but it's a poor one. Okay. So the analogy is really kind of like resonance, except resonance is a purely linear phenomenon. And we're in a strongly nonlinear regime. So the analogy is kind of a poor one, right? So take that into consideration, but imagine that you're in a regime, so like with weak input, right? You, below the phase transition curve, you're in a regime where the television is on and all the channels are simultaneously playing. So it kind of looks noisy, but there's structure to that noise. And you start turning up the gain on one of the channels. And that's what increasing input amplitude is a little bit like. And when you suddenly snap on to, let's say, near HBO or HBO, this is more analogous to like, I don't know, turning the tuning knob on a, in, a, in a car or something. At that point, all of, this, um, all of this reverberation from the other channels gets channeled into this frequency of the external drive. But as I'm saying this, I'm describing resonance, which is, uh, which is a phenomenon that is purely linear. You are in the nonlinear regime. So what happens with when you destabilize one frequency is that the network is oscillating with a certain frequency, two frequencies and they've coupled, three frequencies and it's guaranteed to go to chaos. But there is still an intrinsic sort of frequency component to that chaos. And that frequency component comes from the chord area. That is the number of eigenvalues that are unstable and have non-zero imaginary parts. So it's some combination of those that sets the dip point. Okay, I see. But again, as I said, it's this hand wave. In fact, aside from me, no one's even looked at this, the actual dependence of the effective time scale or the frequency content of this kind of chaos and the chord area. I know the chord area is some function of G to the two thirds. But what is its rigorous connection to this dip point is not, entirely known. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so why have I told you all this, right? I've told you all this because putting inputs onto these networks makes the state of these networks more regular. And this is something that has been shown in experimental data. So this is a paper by Mark Churchland where he collected data from many, many regions um, in the cortex. And he found that as soon as stimulus came on, he found that there was a dip in, in the FANO factor in these networks. So, th so what I want you to take away from this is, yes, you can have spontaneous activity that is dynamic, that changes over time, but the reliability and repeatability issues that these networks suffered from can be mitigated in one of two ways. One way is to train these networks and we will look at them in the advanced lecture, but the other way is really to put inputs on. So let me summarize for you today's lesson, right? So we started by looking at linear RNNs. We looked at, looked at what types of activity can come from linear RNNs. We saw that they have two activity patterns, typically. There's a stable one that goes to a trivial fixed point or zero. The activity that does not decay is unstable and it blows up. So to tame that instability, we introduced nonlinearities. We looked at the specific properties of hyperbolic tangents, and we constructed nonlinear RNNs. We looked at the properties of nonlinear RNNs, specifically with random connectivity for mathematical ease, and we found that it had two advantages. One was that it tamed the instability of the exploding light bulb and you get rich dynamics by making the synapses more variable. So you've made yourself a nice lava map, right? Great, are we done? Answer is no, because the dynamics that you got from this lava lamp were chaotic. So it had a reliability and a repeatability issue. So how do we fix this? How do we get networks like this to both be dynamically rich but still be reliable and repeatable so you can do something with them that's brain-like. And the answer to that goes through training networks, but on the way, we looked at external inputs. We looked at a relatively simple external input so we can understand its behavior and quantify things like signal and noise. And we found that in driven nonlinear RNNs, 
with the H term in the equation, you have input driven activity superposed on rich ongoing background. And without the chaotic sensitivity to initial conditions, this lava lamp became more reliable. That from repetition to repetition, you could get reliable responses because the state of the network became more regular. All that is great, but the brain does more than reconcile subtle inputs and ongoing activity. It's not just a wire. Besides paying attention to subtle inputs or the ticking of my clock past my bedtime, I am also having this you know, rich internal state and I'm capable of doing multiple tasks. How do we get there? And for that, we'll look at training nonlinear RNNs with specialized J. So we're going to be moving from J random, which is what these Js are, or the connectivity of the weight matrix, to introduce task specialized connectivity matrices. And we're going to replace these with J trained, about which we will be able to say less general things because they're not as regular, but they will be much more useful. In fact, the regularity and repeatability that you got by putting inputs in these networks is the reason you're even able to train networks in the first place. So without these papers on externally driven networks, you wouldn't be able to train chaotic networks at all. So for years, when people figured out chaos occurs from 88 onwards, right? people knew networks would become chaotic when G went over 1. Decades went by and people did not know how to use these networks for anything useful, except by fine tuning them so that they would be subcritical. As soon as they became subcritical, however, they were kind of boring because they had, you know, just boring activity. Then Buonamano, Jaeger, Haas, Maas, there's a bunch of people that came forward and they figured out how to train these networks using various algorithms. But the biggest development there was the observation of regularity in the driven case. So that's sort of the, the conclusion. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, take any questions. So let me stop sharing for a second so then I can um, look at some faces. All right, we have uh, four minutes left. So we have many questions during the lecture, so we can have a few more questions. Uh, please. So Yudi, do you want to make a few more comments? I think you'll send a few references um, to the chat room. Yeah, so I just saw like, uh, Professor, Kanaka like mentioned this very interesting idea of like taking the connectome and run it to see how the activity looks like. So like I uh, happens to like encounter some work from Xiaojing, Wang Xiaojing's lab. So they have been using this massive scale connectome data to like uh, to build a like large scale model of the like neural cortex and uh, see there's like uh, so there's a previous work on showing their threshold level, like uh, this theory in uh, consciousness, there's uh, oh, like, there's like, uh, yeah, so they, they're kind of using this kind of uh, data to study uh, questions in threshold level perception, uh, perception in consciousness. Hey, uh, one thing I work... would like to say there though, right? I think you misunderstood what I meant by connectome there. So there is uh, yeah, no macaque uh, yeah. connectome, right? You mean realistic structure in these networks. And yes, XJ has done path breaking work on it. In fact, it's, it's so XJ, I did a rotation with XJ when he was still at Brandeis. Like, I think this is now decades. Uh, I see. Um, yeah, but anyway, yeah. so um, I am so, talking about literally the connectome, right? The physical connectome uh, of the hemi brain of the fly, for example like the actual connections that come from these structures. And I used to think of these with a lot of skepticism, uh, to be honest, earlier. I didn't know if they'll be of value or not, because you know the network isn't doing anything, the tissue is dead, and also it's kind of boring. But then now I'm realizing that you know we're going to have more and more connectomes come out. And it's yeah. not without sure. value to see what happens. Yeah. Can we constrain our networks with something there? So, so I like an obvious question is uh, like I have is uh, 
for the connecton right now, we only know uh, if uh, the J, uh, JIJ is like, has a value of zero, right? So it doesn't right. tell us the va exact That's value, right? right? That's right. right. So, that's right. How do but we reconcile that something question? Something about the size of them. I mean, you can kind of make an argument about the size of the Bhutan being related to its relative strength, stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? There's also, so for example, here's here's a here's a data set that I've been playing with in my lab. The fly hemibrain, once the, so the fly hemibrain is so essentially the fly connectome is organized like you know an apple. Right, the neural pill is all in the middle of the core, and around each of these wheels sit all the cell bodies. So they know a few things here. First of all, the entire connectome of the hemibrain is solved and published, meaning you know how which neuron is whom and is connected to which one with what size synapses. So you can assign some value to this. On the other side are two separate data sets, which are calcium imaging of each neuron in this hemibrain rind. And a third data set that's a calcium imaging of all the neural pair. Right? So, mm -hmm. object two and three that I've mentioned tell you the dynamics. Object one tells you something about the structure of this hemibrain. Mm -hmm. No one's put them together. They can't contradict one another, right? So, if I get this kind of calcium activity on the right hand on, on, the, on these objects from a connect from a connectivity matrix in my networks that has nothing to do with the connectome. I am wrong. It has to do, it has to have something to do with it. Like this group of neurons over here encoding for order is connected to this group of neurons over here encoding for head direction or something. That can't be fundamentally contradictory. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very interesting yep. question yeah, to study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, what do okay, I have awesome. to do to my networks to make them more like biology within reason? And like, you know, honestly, like no one has done more work on this than XJ. Like, you know, even, even when I was rotating with him, right? Like his insistence on, you know, biologically realistic parameters. I mean, these models, he would think were too simplistic. The ones I explained to you today. I see, yeah. Uh, professor, I, I got a question about the phase trans the transition curve. Uh, what about the uh, fix the uh, phase of the input and then the uh, uh, G? Uh, what was the uh, curve will change? So the core. So um, the answer to that is complicated because if you if you give everybody the same phase, then networks like this tend to sync up. What I mean by that is everybody will oscillate with the frequency of the drive. So you'll get unrealistic activity from these networks. So it's not as easy to study. So what about phase and the amplitude and G? Same difference. The phases okay. have to be kept random in the, in the periodic input case. Uh, I got it. Thank you. All right, I think uh, it's 10 o'clock. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Wow, you are so popular today. Great. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a question about the, the last step is that we only get the uh, input driven components from the system. Uh, since there are some in-string information in the Caltech system and they are random, there are a difference between since the uh, even if the input is the same, there are different uh, out, the different output we can get from the chaotic system and they can change the information. So I was wondering if we lose something if uh, we just got the input driven data. Let me see if I understand your question correctly. Are you asking me about the sensitivity of chaotic networks to the input? Or are you asking me if you can get something different from these networks that is not the input? Um, let, me, let me make it clear. And if, I just want if we divide the output to two components and yeah. the one is the input driven component and yep. the other one is the in-stream sync. And they yes. are random, yeah, from the yes. system. But yes. if we lose something, if we just uh, I mean, delimit the, the noise 
So you're asking, so there, so I got the first half of your question, which is there are two components, right? There's the portion yeah. of the activity that comes from the signal, and then there's a portion of the activity that's part of the ongoing background. Yeah, just from the system and the web. From the system, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then your yeah. question is, can we do something to... Uh, if we eliminate the noise, did they lose something from the system? And they contain information possibly but what happens so so if you think about the power spectrum density okay so this would be helpful so um if you if i took the same exact networks that i showed you here right let me let me share for a second um i'm i'm i have the patience if you you are all not super tired but for example this this curve right um you know, it always plays when you don't want it to play. Okay, somewhere here, right? Is this is, is this is related to your question, right? The last panel. If I look at the power spectrum density of these population curves that you see in the middle, the one at the top has a power spectrum density as a function of frequency that is kind of a smoosh. It's the smooth decaying thing with no discernible peaks. The one at the bottom has peaks at the frequency of the input and the harmonics. That's what you're asking. So it has a peak at the, at the frequency, which is 2.5 Hertz, but also all the harmonics and nothing else. And the harmonics are because unlike resonance, this is really this nonlinear phenomenon of high dimensional chaos that is being suppressed. The one in the middle is a mix of both. The power spectrum density has this flat, smooshy bit, but it also has peaks on top of that at the frequency and its harmonics. So you do kind of lose something when you do this phase transition, but you're losing from the background side. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, mm, is that, um, I mean, since we simulate the whole brain use of network, and uh, I think our brain is a purely system, so uh, is that <laughs> not true? So, well, in reality, we don't know, right? Yep. It's probably not chaotic. However, here's the thing, right? So if you look at papers by Nico Shuk, who's at Weill Cornell, S-H-U-C-K, I think is this, or S-C-H-U-C-K, he studies um, using you know, intracranial ECOG arrays in humans. And he also studies the effect of Zolpidem, like the Ambien -like drug for sleep on uh, patients that have persistent vegetative state. So when he looks at EEG for patients that are in comas, the perfectly entrained state that I showed you is actually not desirable. So people that are in coma show these distinct peaks in their power spectrum density of the EEG along with harmonics. People that are awake show this kind of smush. Oh, okay. Okay. And so he has this whole paper on the paradoxical effect of Zolpidem. This is so vague though, because I'm not saying the awake brain is chaotic or something. I'm just saying that there's many more frequencies at play in the biological system. And also this is a drug applied to already epileptic patients. It's so tenuous to make that connection. Yeah, got it. Thank you, Professor. But really like in, in like human work, showing peaks in the power spectrum, not great. Showing kind of a smush, Great. So that was his big discovery, right? Nico Shuk's discovery was persistently vegetative people suddenly sat up, like literally sat up when he gave them Zolpidem. The effect only lasts for a few seconds or something, but it's there's like videos on CNN, uh, the paradoxical effect of Zolpidem on the persistently vegetative people. And they show this phase transition in their power spectrum curve. But it's not it's not the same thing as what we're saying. 
I mean, I think so. I don't know, right? I mean, this is what I taught you today is like this extreme mathematical simplification. It has a nice feature, right? But it is not, uh, and it can give you intuitions, but it, you can't compare it to data. Not directly at any rate. All right, we have some quantum mechanics discussion in the chat room. <laughs> anyway, we, we, we should thank Kanaka again. I think it's very late. Uh, you can save there. this chat for me, right? Because these are like some awesome ones. <laughs> I just want to say, Hey, I'm gonna thank have you to start so making jokes the in the chat window. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think that's when, it, that's when it falls off the rails, right? Like two hours in, and <laughs> all bets are off. Yeah. Kanaka, thank you so much for the very, very clear um, yes, and uh, lecture. It. It's very. Oh. Very, very, very interesting and very clear. My pleasure. I will make the slides and all the references and like that available after the fact. There's a problem set I can circulate if you feel like playing with these systems um, or yeah. reach out at any time if you have questions. First we name can, dot last name. We, we can also add, add you to the uh, Slack channel, maybe. Okay. Do you mind? Uh, maybe I do not. <laughs> then, then we were. Although right now, I think I have 17 Slacks. Wow, that's a lot. So over. maybe so you know, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> okay. But thank you all. I hope to see you um, in person at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully uh, next. Yeah, hopefully in the future years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Take thank care. you. We'll see you again later this week, right? So yeah. see you later thank this you. week. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like we're not seeing each other again. Come on. Right. <laughs> Fair point. I, I don't want anything to do with any of you. Uh, <laughs> All right. I'm going to go. All right. Right Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. All right. Now we have this. Uh, do we need to take a break? I think we need a break. <laughs>